Well, hey everyone. Welcome to episode 348 of F-Stop, Collaborate and Listen with your host, Matt Payne. This week on the podcast, I had a fantastic conversation with one of my favorite photographers and writers, David Duchemin. David is the best-selling author of countless incredible photography books, which go deeply into helping photographers develop their creative vision. In fact, one of David's books was one of my early inspirations all the way back in 2011. I think you'll find this week's chat inspiring and thought-provoking, so stay tuned. This week's episode is brought to you by Nature Photographers Network, or NPN. NPN is my favorite online resource for photography inspiration and conversation. It is a great place to get critiques on your photographs, and with the launch of Nature Vision Magazine, it is simply one of the best resources for nature photographers that exist today. Listeners of the podcast can get a discounted subscription to the magazine and NPN by using the code FSTOP10. Just go to npn.link forward slash FSTOP to join or visit the links in the show notes. When you sign up, be sure to introduce yourself and tag me. I look forward to seeing you there. All right, let's get to this week's episode with David Duchemin. All right, David Duchemin, it is fantastic to have you on the podcast. Hey, Matt, how are you? Hey, you know, I'm not doing too bad. I, I'm excited for our bald man in Patagonia shirt commercial that we're going to do here. <laughs> Don't forget uh, the beards. <laughs> right, beard, bald man, Patagonia. I mean, I think we got it. We're like brothers from another mother, I think. I love it. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, let me just say, uh, when I first got into photography, I was my way of learning was to just go to the library and check out as many books on photography as I possibly could. And you had a bunch of books in the library, and I read a bunch of your books. So you were a huge inspiration to me right out the gate for my photography career. So thank you for, for providing that inspiration to me. Well, what an, what an honor. Thank you. Yes, of course. And then for people that aren't familiar with you, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are? Yeah, so uh, my name is David Duchemin. I'm uh, 52 years old. I live on Vancouver Island. I enjoy long walks on the beach, but usually by myself with a camera. Uh, I, for a long time, was a what I called a world and humanitarian photographer, mostly doing assignment work in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, focusing on uh, children and families, and working for organizations that I was not, I'm not a photojournalist, I was working for organizations that uh, bought into my particular view of the world, which is usually an extremely hopeful one. So I was photographing hopeful stories of change for non-governmental organizations and uh, charities um, around the world. And uh, before that, I had a 12-year career in comedy. I entertained on stages across North America as the rubber chicken guy. And uh, <laughs> much to the relief of audiences everywhere, I retired and uh, in order to focus on uh, my humanitarian photography. And then about, uh, and, and, and when I made that transition, I was coming back to photography. I'd been a photographer since I was, since I was a kid, since 14. And I, I knew at some point I would come back and do the thing that, you know, my first love creatively. Um, but at the time when I was graduating from high school, the idea of being a full-time photographer, I knew that I would end up like photographing weddings, which totally fine, but it's not my thing. And I would have burned <laughs> out, um, and, and, or being a corporate photographer again, for those that do that fantastic, but that just wasn't my thing. I just didn't know what my thing was. So, uh, you know, like every young man, I ran off and joined the circus. And uh, so when, it, when I came back, it was with a very clear idea that I wanted to do humanitarian photography. I wanted to make a difference with my cameras and I wanted to teach. I've always been a teacher in whatever I've been doing. I love teaching. I love speaking. And so I came back and, and returned to photography, started writing to uh, much to my shock and the shock of anyone that ever taught me English. Uh, my books started doing really well. My first book became a bestseller and and it kind of allowed me to focus on the things I wanted to focus on. I, I have freed myself of all client work and now I just, I, I'm very pleased to say I am, I am a professional photographer in the sense that I make my living from photography, but I am primarily an amateur. I do it for the love. I follow my whim and that whim and curiosity has taken me mostly to wildlife and more natural subjects these days. Though I think if you look at 
the body of my work. I've photographed on seven continents. I've photographed in, and continue to photograph in Africa and India and all over the world. Whether I'm photographing human subjects or wilder subjects like whales or sharks or bears, um, my subject really is encounters. It's otherness. It's the desire to be in front of, beside, um, in some kind of encounter with um, other species, other cultures, other people. Um, I'm not really interested in my own culture, my own backyard, the way I am in otherness. And uh, this probably all goes back to the moment I saw Steve McCurry's portrait of Sharbat Gula, the Afghan girl, mm. on the cover of National Geographic and this idea that photography could be could take us into, uh, you know, to the other side of the world and be a window into encounters with other people, other places, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, I'm now mostly a so-called wildlife photographer and uh, live on Vancouver Island, and I pursue subject matter like bears and uh, apex predators. I'm really interested in big, big creatures. I love it. And you know, as a former comedian, should we expect this podcast to be really funny, or is I, there I, you a... know, not, not intentionally, <laughs> not intentionally. I uh, when I hung up my microphone, so to speak, uh, I, there was good reason for that. I was tired of playing a caricature. Um, mm. I was tired of not being myself. And and as the years have gone by, I think I've matured into. I'm very. I, I'm not very serious about the things I believe, but I am very passionate, uh, especially about our craft. And uh, so, yeah, sometimes it comes out as funny, but most of the time I, uh, I think people find out I'm a comedian. They're like, really, you're not, you're, cause you're not that funny. I'm like, I know, that's why I retired. Um, so I wouldn't get your hopes up. Okay. But well, if things get dull, I'll start <laughs> juggling or something. You said that you kind of got a big break with your very first book, having some success and becoming a bestseller. And that was like, I'm guessing about 15-ish years ago now. The industry has shifted quite a lot since then. How would you do it differently today, knowing the obstacles that exist for people to find success in photography? Wow, that's, I, that's a really good question. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. It all comes down to having an audience and bringing something of value to this world. Uh, it, if you are, here's what I would say. If you are like every other photographer, if your messaging, in my case as a teacher, if your messaging is like every other photographer, if you're just spouting off nonsense about f-stops and shutter speeds, all of which are important but are insufficient for making compelling photographs, uh, then, then you're going to have a very hard time distinguishing yourself. And so ultimately it's, you know, I would do everything I did previously, which is study communication and marketing and branding. I studied marketing as though it were a craft of its own because it is. And, and I studied what it meant to build an audience, to serve an audience. For me, I don't write newsletters. I write from my heart something every couple of weeks. Um, and I put it out th with the intention to make people's lives better. I think that shows and I think it attracts a certain audience. People that are really into gear don't generally follow me because I'm the gear is good but vision is better guy. Um, I'm very all over the map where gear is concerned and I kind of my eyes kind of glaze over when you, people start talking about or asking questions about gear. You know, I switched to Sony about two years ago because of this transition of wildlife and my previous system wasn't working as well as I wanted for this. And I get now, I get all these questions about, and Sony's the worst. Like, I I was looking at getting an A73Q or whatever. And I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know. I, I haven't got the foggiest idea. What I don't study Sony. I study photographs. Um, so I'm not the guy people go to for questions about gear, um, especially if what they're looking for is to plunk their credit card down and spend money because I'm the guy that's usually going to go, you know, what you have is probably good enough. You should spend that money on opportunities to make photographs. People end up with a bag full of gear and then they have no money left to go to, to the places that their heart really longs to experience, you know, to India or to go photograph grizzly bears. All this kind of thing costs money. Save the money. Don't upgrade all the time. Upgrade your experiences. So that's the kind of messaging that uh, that people come to me for, and and as a result, it's a little different. It's in in a world that's so gear obsessed. Um, I'm kind of trying to bring a little bit of a different 
more human perspective to the whole thing. I, I like to talk more about how we are creative and um, how we make photographs um, rather than the gear that's involved because I don't think functionally there's a lot of difference between the guy that uses a Pentax and the guy that uses a Sony, uh, except that I don't even know if they make pen Pentax anymore. <laughs> but I used to be a Pentax shooter. I started with a Pentax, so I have a soft spot in my heart for that quirky little company. <laughs> well, let, let's let's go down that road of creativity. You know, as you mentioned, you've, you've dabbled in all sorts of forms of photography and you're now focused on wildlife and nature. And I'm curious if you could speak to the intent of that shift and how it has informed your, your creative path. Yeah, that's a great question. I, th I think part of it was, uh, well, a big part of it was COVID. You know, the, the pandemic hit and nobody was going anywhere. I had already started to turn my attention to wildlife, but um, it became very clear I was not get I was not going to India anytime soon, even if all of a sudden everything was was rosy. The idea my my desire to be around other human beings has changed, especially crowds. Whereas I used to love it, I love the you know the gritty streets and I, I love that kind of thing. Now I'm like you know put me by myself on a riverbank with bears. I'm just much happier with that. It was following it was following that thread. It was following my curiosity and just like I, I'm a big believer in do the thing you want to do if, if people people often you know what should I do and I, I don't generally like to be beholden to ideas of should and ought and it's more a question of well what do you want to do you know um, I didn't want to be bound by the idea that everyone knew me as a humanitarian photographer I wanted to uh, pursue the thing that I actually wanted to do and it, it turned out it was it was wildlife and um, getting in the water with humpback whales and sharks and and these are a, a return to my roots. It's not anything new. I you know when I first picked up a camera, I was photographing like like half the photographers out there. I was photographing ducks in the middle of a pond and <laughs> and I've always I, I've been a camper and a traveler and an explorer and I, I want to see the natural world and so it was just a return to a different kind of wildness that I was getting out of my India adventures, for example, or um, traveling to Mongolia and, and doing people. Nah, it was just a question of, you know, finding the critters rather than, than the, the human beings. But I don't know that it's changed my, my creative path so much. I think my big rule in creativity is always follow your curiosity and see where it goes. It's always an exploration. If you're not a little bit nervous about what you're about to, to try, it's probably because A, you're not risking enough, or B, it's you've already done it. And and why keep mowing the same patch of grass? Like I want to try new things and and no, it's it's never like it, when I start experimenting with something, it's all there's a lot of swear words involved. There's a lot of frustration. Because <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how to do this. Um, there was a great quote, someone once asked Picasso if he knew what his paintings were would were going to look like before he painted them. And he said, Of course not. If I knew that, I wouldn't paint them. So there is a sense in which all of this uh, is a journey of discovery that we go into it. I go into it going, I, I have this notion. I want to follow it to its end, but I don't know what it's ultimately, ultimately going to look like. I don't know what the skills it's going to require me to learn are. But that for me is the exciting part, is figuring it out, is figuring out how to work within our constraints. Um, everyone talks about thinking outside the box creatively, and I'm like, we're all inside a box. Um, the, the real act of creativity is thinking in the box and figuring out what to do that's different, because the box is our problem. The bo box is our creative obstacle. Not to get out of it, but to work within it and figure out, because ultimately we all have constraints. We will never escape. And, and I think learning to work within constraints is one of the keys to being a flourishing, uh, happy, creative um, you know, rather than always just try I mean, using all your energy to tear the box down, the box is the box. It is whatever. It'll change and grow and whatever. But the the ability of a creative person to go, okay, I only have a 35 millimeter lens. Let's see what I can pull pull off with it. I only have my Sony A660, and it's a crop sensor, and it's not so good with this, but it it, it will do this fine. Let's see what I can make with that. Or I only have my iPhone or whatever. Everyone's missing something. Everyone, especially photographers, my God, the list of things photographers think they need. Oh, if only I had this. Look, if you wait for conditions to be perfect, for you to have the right gear and the right light, and you'll never make a photograph, you know? And so better to just to embrace those constraints and, and move forward with them and let them, as the old saying goes, you know, the, the obstacle is the way.
Um, it's not it's not the thing that's in the way. It is, in fact, the the journey of creativity is embracing and working with constraints. So I don't know that my my uh, journey has affected my creativity so much as my creativity has affected my journey. Mm -hmm. I, I liked what you said about mowing the same patch of lawn and taking risks because I think there is a lot of fear involved when it comes to engaging in new types of photography or going to new locations or, you know, I'm a, primarily a landscape photographer and I've recently started photographing wildlife because I have to for my job and I oh, don't have to. It's actually really amazing that I get to do that. But, uh, you know, and, you know, I, I'm like, oh, I don't have the right gear to do that super well. But that's why I think gear is such an obsession with photography is that people have this faulty assumption that gear is going to overcome the fears that we have about our own inadequacies, our own inexperience with different types of subjects or types of experiences. And, and I, I love what you said about just do it. Like, get out and pursue the path. The obstacle is the path. I think that's an incredible insight. Um, I just, I really love that you said that. Thanks. I, I can't take credit for uh, the idea of mowing the same patch of grass. That actually was something. Uh, you, are you familiar with the, the cartoon Calvin and Hobbes? Of course. So Bill Watterson, who was for years the, the creator of Calvin and Hobbes, he, he eventually, just kind of out of the blue and for various reasons, retired, but one of the things he said was he was beginning to feel like he was mowing the same patch of grass and it was offering him, he'd said what he wanted to say, it was offering him no further challenge. And and I think it's important that we be willing to take a zigzag. You know, I imagine in Picasso's career, look at all the phases he went through and, you know, they, suddenly he's the blue phase and, you know, he went from actually very, you know, natural looking stuff to, to cubism and like he, he just, he was all over the map and he didn't let anyone nail him down. And I think that's really important that we talk so much about, you know, specialization and photography and I think there's a through line of all the stuff that I photographed, but to let it stop you because well that's not how everyone knows me who cares Bitch, try it experiment with it fall on your face and come crawling back and do the thing you you know you once did maybe you'll have learned something um i creativity is is to me is this giant fuzzy hairball that we get to kind of explore but there's no it's so fuzzy around the edges there's no hard rules about do this or do that and so it suits my i'm my personality i'm a bit of an anarchist in this regard and so it suits me to, you know, kind of look at stuff like this and go, like, why are we so obsessed with all these so-called rules, you know? And they say, even, and I'll, here I will disagree with Picasso, who said, you, you have to know the rules before you break them. You have to know the principles. You have to understand how things work and why. But I still don't believe there are any rules. There is no rule of thirds. There's a principle behind that so-called rule. If you understand it, then you can do all kinds of things with it. Um, but... There are no rules. There's no one waiting in the in the uh, you know in the shadows, just waiting for you to shoot the wrong kind of histogram. And you know, I, I, if we can abandon that and just go, what do I want to do? What do I want to try? What do I want to experiment? Let's see if I can fail really like spectacularly, because through those spectacular failures, you're not just learning to do it the right way, which is another conversation. I don't believe there is a right way. You're learning to do it your way. You're just like Jimi Hendrix learned to play the guitar Jimi Hendrix way. He, Everyone else that knew how to play guitar would look at Jimi Hendrix at the time and go, yeah, that's not how you play guitar. Exactly. But it is how Jimi Hendrix played guitar. And I am on a journey to figure out, and most of us are, I hope, how we, how I specifically, how you, Matt, make your photographs. Because we don't need more graphic representations of what the world looks like you know we've got that which google has satisfied our need to know what it looks like now we have the opportunity to interpret and give a unique perspective on this stuff i don't even know if there's a question behind that but uh <laughs> words started coming out of my mouth so no that's good it's interesting i, I had a, a little laugh when you said histogram because you know everyone's got it hammered into their head that you have to expose to the right and all of that kind of stuff and you know have a nice clean histogram and you know you think about that and there's certain types of lighting conditions or subjects where sometimes it might make sense to totally blow out your highlights or totally crush your shadows to achieve a certain aesthetic and for me that's all about experimentation and 
the beautiful thing about digital photography is like you get to take a picture and see what it looks like and oh that experiment failed or actually that experiment's kind of neat i'm exactly. gonna try something new so i i encourage people to like okay people tell you to do it this way but try something else and see if you like it you never know i think some of the most interesting light does not fit within most histograms and so you have a choice do you crush your shadows. Look, I obliterate shadows. <laughs> shadows for me are about mood and mystery. And I haven't, now I'm not going to do it intentional. I'm not going to underexpose so much that I can't recover something of that data. For me in digital, the, the key is get a great bit of data. I get enough data that you can move it around. But it's not whether you lose detail in the shadows or in the highlights, it's which details you lose. And are you, is that important to what you're trying to accomplish? And there's so, there are people that have spectacular histograms. I mean, they're just so reined in, they're not losing data here or data here. Witness the HDR movement of years ago where everything oh, looked God. like, you know, like clown vomit. And look, some <laughs> people did it really well and that's, that's fine. So it, it was a technique and some people used it for a certain thing. But I tell you what, they had so much detail, I didn't know where to look. And they obliterated, many of them, not all of them, the mood and the mystery that shadows, shadows, I love shadows. I want more shadows. I want to take that black slider and crank it to, you know, and and to, to have a perspective on what your histogram should look like, what your shadows should or shouldn't do, what your highlight... It, Look, I don't even meter anymore. I, I don't know. Someone asked me recently what metering mode I was on. I'm like, I don't meter. I, don't, I haven't the foggiest idea. I look through my viewfinder. I read the histogram and I say, is that appropriate to what I'm trying to accomplish or isn't it? That's all I need. I don't need to, you know, meter off a patch of snow and then overexpose by three stops to maintain my whites. I mean, I learned how to do all that. I was a film photographer for years, but now it's like, just look at your histogram. And then not ask, is this the right histogram, but is, am I getting the, the right amount of data to do what I want to with this photograph, considering the size of my sensor and the, you know, how crazy high my ISO is and whether I want to use noise reduction software and all that. But it, again, know the principle behind all this. Figure out how a histogram works and why. And then you've got so much creative freedom to go, okay, I understand it. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to shoot this scene the way I want it to be shot. And to your point, you mess it up, you mess it up, you try it again. You know, like yeah. if you're, if you're not introspective enough to look at your photograph and your histogram and go, okay, that's not working out. I need to go repeat that. Or I, I'm convinced that apart from visual language stuff, composition, all that balance and tension, and these things take longer to learn. But anyone should be able to, within six months of owning a camera, should be able to master exposure and get a, a well-exposed, sharp photograph and then start experimenting with all the things that actually make a compelling photograph. Yeah, I was recently teaching a workshop. It was a night photography workshop. And, you know, people are really nervous about missing the photograph and getting their settings right and all that stuff. And... We've gone over the settings over and over and over again, but you know some people forget and it's fine. Sure. But I, I had to laugh because um, a few people kept asking like, oh, what, you know, what settings should I use this time? And it's like, why don't you just try something, look at the result, and then change your settings based on what you see. That, sure. That's how we came up with these settings and now we're trying to empower you to be able to do the same on your own without our help. And, and it's, that, uh, that, that language is really important, Matt, because the fault lies squarely with those of us in education and the photography industry. There's such a hunger for tips and tricks and shortcuts and gimmicks and magic buttons. And, you know, if we pander to that rather than saying, let me teach you why I do the thing that I do. Let me teach you what makes a good digital exposure. Let's look at the principle here. Like, here's why you don't want probably a 30 second exposure with northern lights because you're going to you're going <laughs> to blur your stars. If you want blurry stars, okay, but like and and the minute we start taking shortcuts with our teaching, our students who are hungry for the shortcuts are just going to grab onto that. And so it is I I really think it's our responsibility to to really take those moments to go, okay, hang on before I I know you just want the you just want the answer, but <laughs> let's backtrack a little here and and be very clear about what we're trying to accomplish and what the principle is 
so that you don't forget it in 10 minutes when you're like, I can't remember, was it F8 or was it, it's okay, you know, let's back up, let's talk it through. But there is, I think you're tapping into something that is really important and that's the hunger for shortcuts, you know, yeah. it's just, whew, it's, and everyone does it, you know, I, I mean, when I'm out, I, I read the articles that are out there and I'm just banging my head going, people deserve better than this. There's, this is a this is a long game craft. This is a I've been at it for 35 years craft, uh, not a well I've you know mastered it and you know a couple blog articles. It's going to take folks if you're listening to this. It is going to take some time. Enjoy the journey, but learn it. Learn this stuff well. Don't learn the shortcuts. Don't learn the gimmicks. Learn this stuff well so that it serves you over the long haul. Yeah, and I, I would I would suggest that there's really no such thing as mastering photography i mean every time i feel like i've learned everything i figured i could learn someone teaches me something new that i was like i never thought about it that way and that's a really good technique or gosh that's an interesting way to approach that particular scene or that problem or oh my gosh that's such a creative way to compose that particular image or use of depth of depth of field in that creative way so for me what's exciting about photography and probably scary for some people is that it truly is a lifelong learning experience that um, if you're humble, just go along with the ride and see where it takes you. <laughs> and, and you will always learn some new thing. So there will always be some new challenge and it will be that challenge because challenge leads to flow. There's this whole idea about creative flow mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. flow if uh, there's a, a guy that studied and sort of annotated what flow really means and he basically came down with the idea that one of the key the one of the most important parts of it is challenge you right. cannot be in flow without challenge uh, without it you're just bored and there is no flow in boredom it, things come easily but that's not optimal performance that's just mailing it in and so I think if you're ever in a position where you're like yeah this is I got this this is easy I, you're probably not creating the work you think you're creating. There probably isn't that spark of, oh my God, it might not work. I mean, this is, it, it's not in Latin, but at some point in my life, you know, my my whole life's motto is going to be, well, that didn't go as planned. Uh, you know, and that's, I mean, that's great. It. I learn more about my craft. I learn how to overcome a new thing. I was in uh, northern part of BC just a couple of weeks ago, and I really ha had this idea for, uh, a very low point of view grizzly bear shot. Normally you're shooting with 600 millimeter lenses and and that's fine. I love my I love my gear, don't get me wrong. A gear is good. I just think it's insufficient for making great photographs. We need more. And um not more gear, just more, you know. <laughs> and and uh and so I really wanted to put my 16 to 35 millimeter lens on. I wanted to get on the ground low and of course bad idea with with grizzlies you know I mean you have to respect these animals and so I put my camera in a little cage that I've had built for uh, mm. rhinos when I'm in Africa mm -hmm. and I I spent I spent a couple days just banging my head against the wall trying to get this thing to work and figuring it out figuring out the tech figuring out the angle figuring out the timing figuring out figuring out figuring out I spent like way more time figuring it out and at the end I just barely got it locked in I got a couple really beautiful lucky shots that I'm thrilled with but what it mostly said is next time now I've got some ideas about how this can really work to look at it as a failure like oh I went and I, I you know I really screwed that up no I didn't I learned how to do it and so next time and when I'm back in Africa I've got new tech I've got new ideas Next time I'm back with the Grizzlies, same thing. Here, it's this forward thing. So I like your, you know, the idea that mastery, I look at mastery as a journey, not as a place you arrive at. Right. Um, because I do think, you know, we need to master on some, mastery to me is about control. We need to figure out how to control our, our tech, our, our raw materials, light, space, and time. We need to, we need to master the visual language. We need to be able to understand what possibilities exist for composition. Composition is so much more than just put the interesting thing on, on you know, a, a line in, on a grid. And I mean, where's the balance? Where's the tension? Where's your white space? You know, like there's, there's I mean, I've got a whole course on composition. It's, it's endless. And if you ever get to the point where you're like, I don't know, I got nothing left to learn. I guess I've mastered this. You're not digging hard enough because 35 <laughs> years later, I haven't found the bottom. Like I'm still just 
digging away. Yeah. <laughs> but I love it. I love it. And and every now and then, yeah, you get a little bit you you, you get a little bit bored, and you're like, there's there's got to be a new challenge. And so you pick up a you know a tilt tilt shift lens, or you learn really finally learn how to use your wide angle, or you know there's so many ways to bring that spark back uh, because that's part of flow too. You got to be interested. You got to have something to you know to chew on. I totally agree. I know a lot in your writings and your books. You talk a, you talk a lot about what we we call voice, right? Mm. And I was curious if you could define voice as it refers to our photography and perhaps speak to how we might develop it. Well, the first question, the answer is no, I can't define voice. Um, <laughs> good, I, I've good, been good. working on this for a long time, but I don't think it's important that we define it. I think it's important that we have a sensitivity to it and, and question, is our photographic voice clear is it authentic and and always ever evolving of course it's not it's not a one time like ah figure it out i found my voice i don't think it works that way because we are always changing as mm. as people as artists if we're not changing something's wrong but i i look at voice as when you look at when you really look at the work of known photographers um annie Leibovitz, joe mcnally um saul lighter i mean it, I, the list is so endless. Sam Abel, if you look, I can almost guarantee you that if I went through, if, if they po all posted their stuff on Instagram, I could scroll through and I could be like, that's Annie, that's Joe, that's Elliot Erwitt. That's like, I, you go through, and even if, even if you've never seen that photograph before, even if there was no photo credit, because they are drawn to certain things, certain subjects, uh, they have certain ideas about that, they have certain preferred camera angles, so I could turn on the TV and within three seconds of a Wes Anderson movie, I could be like, this is a Wes Anderson movie. Quentin Tarantino, same thing. Like there are, they have a distinct voice. There's a fingerprint that they put on their work because of their preferences. It's not one thing. It's not like, oh, he's that guy that works in black and white. Well, who isn't? It's, he's that guy that works in black and white, wide angle lens, pushed in close, low camera angles, and he focuses on elephants. Okay, that guy, right? That's voice. When people when people are so scattered with what they photograph, how they photograph, everything's you know all over the map, which is common for younger uh, learning photographers. And nothing wrong with that. You just haven't found it yet. But as you grow, you're going to realize a you don't love everything. You have strong visual preferences. There are some focal lengths. I you'll never see a picture from me with a 50 millimeter focal length, not these days. I just not interested. It's just like I see the world that way. I I want like 16 millimeters pushed in closer. I want 600 millimeters way back. And I want that camera to be somewhere interesting. Uh, that's part of my voice. So it's what we say and it's how we say it. And uh, because it's a metaphor, because voice is kind of a, an analogy, it's a little bit fuzzy. Um, but I'm okay with that. I, I think what is important is the question of we can only we can only say so much. We can only uh, focus on so many things. And while many photographers like to photograph everything, and there's nothing wrong with that, except that you are missing the opportunity to get really familiar with um, with those preferences, with the things that you're photographing, to get past the low hanging fruit. To, uh, to really learn how to use whatever it is, medium format, 35 millimeter film, certain um, focal lengths. If you're an artificial light guy, it's gonna take you a long time to figure out how you really know how to use that. Eventually, if you are true to your own preferences, none of us are so over the map that, that you're going to remain kind of visually schizophrenic. You are going at some point to really focus in and and, you're just going to get better at what you do. You can't get better. It's it's that idea of, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. When you're trying to photograph every subject down under the sun, I'm sorry, you will never get to know if you just once every 10 years photograph elephants, you will never get to know elephants and their behavior in a way that will allow you to photograph them with any kind of subtlety or insight or nuance or power. So that's the strength of you know, most musicians, they don't sing about everything. They sing about certain issues, you know. 
and they don't sing in every style. You're not going to buy an album from U2 that goes from jazz to heavy metal to Kenny Rogers cover songs. U2 is going to sound like U2. And they will evolve, and their voice will change with time, And but they have a distinct voice, as does Metallica, as does Miles Davis, as does Jimi Hendrix, etc., etc., etc. The only ones that don't are the cover bands, because they're just trying to be like everyone else. They're making no choices. And they might actually be extremely talented, but they don't know because they've, they've never looked for their own voice. They're just too busy. Now, I know I'm generalizing here, but they're just too busy doing what everyone else is doing. So there's just some strong benefits in going, right now, don't worry about your whole photographic career. Right now, this is what I want. If you, and that's macro flowers in black and white, then do macro flowers in black and white and just do it and milk everything you can out of it. And when you go, you know what, I'm done with flowers, great. Go to elephants or rhinos or portraits or whatever. Maybe you have learned something in that time photographing macro, black and white macros of flowers. You've learned about structure. You've learned about composition. You've learned about be what makes beautiful light for you. And, and um, you understand how to use chiaroscuro and, and different, like, different techniques. You can carry that into portraiture. People are not that different from flowers. It's not, this, it's not the subject matter that, that is important. It's photographing what matters and that you get to de determine that. Once again, I don't know what got me off on that. I can't remember your question, but I probably somewhere in there, I probably skirted it and then changed the topic. No, you're good. It's interesting as you were talking, I found myself seeing a possible interesting juxtaposition between what we were talking about earlier in terms of experimentation and following your curiosity and constantly learning as we do in photography with this idea of developing voice and once you've found that voice sticking with that voice because I feel like there's kind of a sweet spot where they're not serving each other necessarily in a complementary fashion uh, because if you've found your voice then it's potential that or if you've you know like you said you're obsessed with uh, black and white flowers well, you're not experimenting anymore with other subjects. And so I think it's an interesting conundrum we find ourselves in where you, you, you could get stuck one way or the other if you're not careful. Yeah, it's, it's, about, it's about authenticity for me. And that's such an overused word. I'm almost embarrassed to say it. But it's about <laughs> being true to yourself and a, a recognizing that there's, some, there's great value in focusing on you know, on the things that you are interested in, want to do, and leaving everything else behind. And then as your interests change and, you know, suddenly you find, like, if you went back, there's a period where I was gone from social for about three years. And in between there, there is an, a big noticeable gap in my style. I was doing a lot of black and white. My mood was very black and white, mostly black. <laughs> um, and I came out of COVID and through that period photographing, and I, I have a very hard time even seeing in black and white anymore. My work has moved on to less gritty, less, um, frankly, dark subjects. And But the through line is still there. My use of point of view, my use of uh, optics, my experimentation with slower shutter speeds and, and visceral photographs. I think there's a very strong through line there. It's just I go from black and white photographs of people in India and a lot of stuff around faith and religion to uh, bears. And uh, on some level, it's a big shift, but it's stylistically, um, if you look a little deeper, it's not that big. Like I'm, I think people would still recognize me there. But again, you know, we change, we grow. And, and the photographer that's making those photographs now is not the same photographer that was making gritty black and white photographs three, four years ago. There are parts of me are still there, are strong parts of me, my core, but I've, I've changed and we, we, need, we need to be sure we never, in the pursuit of this one recognizable voice, it's not for branding purposes, it's not so that we can you know, be famous or so people will um, not mistake our work for someone else's, it's so that we make photographs that are truly our own. And then when that changes, we change too. How would you differentiate between voice and vision? Oh, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> it's so he, he, voice is 
Uh, I mean, they're connected in the sense that, like, when we think about Martin Luther King Jr., you can hear his voice and his I had a dream speech. His voice is not separate from the sound of his voice, the timber of it, the, the volume of it, is not separate from the things that he talked about. Um, if he suddenly started reading a, a script for a, a Hollywood comedy movie or, or a, a Friends episode, you probably wouldn't even pick up on the fact that it was Martin Luther King Jr. because you're like, whoa, hang on a sec. I, his voice, it, part of it is what he says. When we talk about his voice, we're not just talking about what it sounds like. We're talking about the things that he said. Um, so I think they're connected. Um, I have stopped, largely stopped using the word vision because it's a, it's a difficult analogy because one, we're talking about visual things. Um, and I've started just to say intent. Uh, what is your intent for this? What is your intention? What are you trying to accomplish with this thing? And then, and that, so that would be vision. And then voice would be, how are you going to give that its best expression? Mm. So um, one is kind of the maybe the the mental stuff, and the other is the the uh, how it makes itself into a photograph, so that it's it's a thing rather than just a, a you know a mental artifact. Um, that would probably be how I would. But again, analogies and metaphors, fond as I am of them, they are all imperfect. Um, the question is, do you know what you want to photograph? Like, are you open to figuring that out and then finding the very best expression, not only of that thing, the subject, but your perspective on that subject? What is it that you want to say about, you know, yes, I photograph elephants, but what am I trying to say about elephants? Because unless I know that, all I'm doing is I could use any camera in the world. I could pick up my iPhone, go click there. I've got a picture of that elephant. But it takes much more intentional choices to make a photograph about not only that elephant, but my emotions about that elephant, my thoughts, my feelings. All of the choices that we make come from those questions, not merely, you know, what are you photographing? It's, yeah, it's almost it's almost as if voice is the is the what and the how combined together, and vision is the why. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I again, I, I'm always a little leery because I think the borders between those are pretty porous. And, and the important thing is they do this, right? The important thing right. is uh, vision without or intention without an ability to express it or execute uh, without craft. And this is where we come back full circle to the gear because, yes, gear does on some level matter. The, the fact is there are certain pieces of gear without which I could not achieve what I'm going for, whether that's I really, really need a slow shutter speed and for that I need a neutral density filter or I really, really need a faster burst mode like 30 frames a second and therefore need a different camera or I'm shooting astrophotography and I really want clean shots of the night sky while you might want a full frame camera with a, a stronger low light capacity and, and a really fast wide angle lens. I mean, our gear choices they do matter on on some level. They're just not the first thing. They're they're, they're the again the cart. It's the cart and the horse. Um, the gear stuff very much is the the cart. I think. Yeah. Uh, Got to figure out that how and that why before you pick up your credit card and get it from B and H. <laughs> For sure. Otherwise, you'll end up with a bunch of stuff you have no idea what you're gonna do with. Which... Yeah, no, and now, I mean, that does open another thing, and that is, don't get me wrong, sometimes you just, you get a piece of gear because you're interested, you don't know what you're going to do with it, and that, you learn something new. So there's there's almost no, like, every, I'm very conscious as having taught now for a number of years, and people listen to what I say, and they come back with these little sound bites, and they're like, ah, but you said, and I'm like, yeah, but I also <laughs> said, you know, and the fact is, a new piece of gear, as long as you're not going into debt over it, you're not putting it on your credit card, and it's, it's, because uh, it's about possibilities, and the possibility is that tilt shift lens could teach you some really cool things, that Maybe you, you've never used strobes before and you finally pick up a strobe and you say, I don't like strobes. I don't want to use them. But there are possibilities creatively for those that do. And it may just be that that changes your life creatively because suddenly you found, you know, the way of expressing the thing you want to express. You, you can never say never really because ultimately it, it's just, but it's about possibility. If you're spending all that money on gear when you, sh when you would be better off pursuing you know, a trip to 
wherever, um, or renting a studio for a week, or hiring a model, or whatever that's going to actually get you to a point of making, or printing your work, or whatever. There, there are some choices that photographers make that I kind of go, hmm, is that really going to make your photography better? <laughs> only, you can t only you can tell me. But the question does beg to be asked. Oh, 100%. And it does pain me to say this, but sometimes, at least for me, getting a new piece of gear can be a helpful way to kind of break out of a rut in terms of you know, getting tired of shooting the same types of scenes in the same types of ways. Sometimes if you pick up, you know, like I just got this uh, 3514, right? Well, I got it mostly for Astro, like, but hmm, thinking that could be an interesting way to photograph flowers or photograph people, you know, like there's lots of applications for a lens like that. So sometimes it's fun to just get a new piece of gear to expand your horizons or to get to get weird a little bit and see what you can pull off. I, I think that's okay too, as long as you don't go into debt, it's, like you said. Yeah, and, and it, may <laughs> even be, it may even be necessary. I mean, again, we're talking about possibilities. And so when I left my Fujifilm camera system behind, and it was great for the street. I loved it. I loved the ergonomics. The images were, were they were fine. They were great even. But for wildlife, when I picked up my Sony A1 and a 600 millimeter f4 camera for the first time, and it locked focus on a on an eagle, and I was I felt like I'd like entered some kind of magic Harry Potter land. <laughs> Suddenly, I was like 20 years in the future with gear that actually focused. I was like, this changes everything. My composition didn't change. My sense of balance and tension didn't change. My sense of timing did all the things that make my photographs my own didn't change. My ability to actually get the shot changed. And so there are times where you kind of just got to go, look, I can get a look out of a 600 F4 that I cannot get out of a 200 to 600 that, you know, is a whatever, a 6.3 or whatever, 6.5. Uh, it, it, I will just have a different look. Fine. Yeah. Well, I'm Just jealous. be aware that one of those costs an awful lot more than the other, and that may not be a possibility for everyone. Yeah, I was going to say, I have the two to six, so that makes me jealous. <laughs> it's a, right. You know what? It's a fine lens, and it it's is, what it I is. throw in if I'm going to like, uh, you know, carry a backpack down to the water or something on the off chance I see something. Yeah. Um, but I tell you what, when I'm out photographing, and I pick that camera up with that lens and I'm, there's something about it the quality of the contrast mm -hmm. I, just, I just don't like it as much if I'd never picked up that 600 uh, f4 it would have been I would have made do, do with it and that's that is the key you will make do with whatever it is that you have but when you get a different tool you will probably use it in a different way and that can open new possibilities just don't think that it's going to do that all by itself You've, right. you're the one buying the camera Right, exactly. But it is a pretty, it is a pretty nice lens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, David, you you refer to yourself as a voice for human creativity in an industry that dwells too much on the technical, and I was wondering if you could tell us more about what you mean by that, especially the voice for human creativity. Yeah, the word that I, I use a lot is experience. Um, what is important to me is a the the experience your experience making photographs so when i'm teaching students i'm very conscious of what is the thing they're trying to to create what are they getting out of this it may not be that they that the goal here is to make a good photograph it may be that the best photograph they could make frankly isn't a great photograph but is it represents risk it represents a step forward or a lesson learned that to me is much more important than that they get and immediately get a photograph that they think is good because that sometimes takes a long time to arrive at. Well, there are some photographers who go out every day with their cameras. That's not me. I have other creative pursuits. I, I make photographs and I love it, don't get me wrong, but I do it because it is creative. And if something else scratches that itch, like I do a lot of writing, and I am just as happy, sometimes more happy, sitting down in my, my chair uh, with my laptop and writing for three hours. I love that. It's the experience of exploring the unknown. I start out with a blank page. I'm like, I have no idea where this is going. And I start writing. And it's the same thing that I get when I pick up my camera and I leave my hotel room in, in India. And I walk down the street and I'm like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm going to see. I don't know what's going to happen. I will respond. There will be improvisation. It's all of that 
that messy thing that I love. And at the end of the day, you come back both, you know, with writing and photography and I imagine other disciplines where you're like, I had no idea that that's what, you know, you're looking at a painting and going, I did not know I was going to paint that this morning. I come back from photographing. I'm like, I had no idea. Nothing prepared me for that shot, for that moment, the intersection of light, space, and time that is in that image. Mm. Nothing. And and it's that that I love. It's the exploration. It's not, oh my God, look how sharp this picture is. I mean, these days anyone can make a sharp photograph. You know, I mean, sometimes you, you don't. But the tech is there. It's not that that hard. Uh, to you know, choose a, a, a faster shutter speed and put your camera on a tripod or whatever. Like fast, sharp photographs and well exposed photographs should not be the the end goal for photographs. We surely we can do more. And so because there are so many other voices and because that stuff just doesn't scratch the itch for me, I want to talk about the human stuff and how do we experience not just making the photograph but the photographs themselves. What about what about mood? What about mystery? What about story? The things that we actually, we don't respond to sharpness in a photograph. And if we do, it's because you're a photographer and, and you're going, oh my God, look how sharp it is. You're, you're a very small percentage of the people that will respond to that image is most of us are going to respond with our heart and our, our brain. We're going to read a story or see the light or the mood or a juxtaposition. We're going to laugh. We're going to cry. That human stuff, that visceral stuff where we respond, I'm more interested in talking about that stuff and why composition matters for that and, and how we can expose, you know, not just what's the light doing, but what can I do with the light? All of that stuff is the human stuff. And it drives me crazy every time, insert your favorite camera brand here, comes up with an ad in the latest magazine that's like, your, your secret to cre creative photography. And I'm like, no, no. It's, uh, photographers are the secret to creative photography. The latest camera, the one we are all just so excited about. Don't don't we have such short memories? Don't you remember a year ago when the model that preceded it, we were all so excited about that. And then the, a year before that, it's like, oh, this one's gonna change. I never need another cam. This one's gonna do it. I know. A year um, later, we're like dusting it, off the credit card, going, well, you know, the camera did not get any worse. It's just our expectations and our, and our, frankly, our photography didn't get any better. And so we then get to a point where we're like, man, I used this new camera for a year, you know, something's not working. Yeah, something's not working. It's you. It's not the camera. You're not putting in the work. You're not taking risks. You're not investing where you could be in your photography. How many photographers are actually studying photographs? You, you can't just study the manual that came with your guitar. You gotta study songwriting. You gotta study what makes great music, what moves people. And then you gotta study performing. And there's so much more than just being Eddie Van Halen and knowing how to make a great guitar. He does that, but it's not what made him Eddie Van Halen any more than Brian May or Jimi Hendrix or, you know, and so, there is more, that's all I'm saying. And it's the human stuff, not the technical, because the technical is always going to slowly creep forward and the prices will go up and you know, it's in their best interest to always have a new thing to offer and, and to promise that it's gonna be the thing that makes your pictures better. There's still gonna be boring pictures. There's just gonna be sharp, boring pictures with more megapixels and better dynamic range. If you want them not to be boring, that's your job. The cameras, there's no, you know, unsuck filter on the camera. And so that's the stuff I like to talk about, the human experience, the creativity, and, and the human experience of reading the photograph and feeling wonder and awe and anger and all these emotions that I think photography is an incredibly powerful medium. And so that's what I get jazzed about. Yes, I get excited when there's a new piece of gear and I think it can, it can actually help me in my craft. But not very, you know, it's at the end of the day, these cameras are just, all they're going to do is add one more confusing button to me and it's going to be harder to use. Right. Well, you know, I want to uh, explore something you just said a little bit further. You were talking about going out your door. I think you were talking about going in the streets of India and you go out your door. You don't really know where you're going. You don't know what you're going to encounter. But for you, the magic sauce is you're gonna to have to respond to that. You're going to have to make a compelling image, not necessarily having a preconceived idea going into it. 
And I find myself making my best images when I'm doing the same thing. Like maybe I just pick a trail to hike down and I have no idea what I'm going to find on that trail. But my job as a photographer is to pay attention, notice my surroundings, have a conversation with my subjects, interpret those subjects and make an interesting photograph of what I encounter. I find that to be a much more enjoyable process. I know a lot of people get a lot of joy out of, I'm going to put myself on this exact GPS coordinate at this time because the moon's going to be here and the sun's going to be here and blah, 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 blah. And like everything's planned out and pre-scripted and, and those make really awesome images. Trust me, I have used to do a lot of that myself and I still do some of that. But I'm curious if you could speak to how you see those two different approaches to photography. I mean, you could think about it, not just landscape photography, but also I in mean, fashion or lifestyle. Like a lot of the images that I see winning competitions, for me, it's very obvious that they're pre-envisioned. Like it's set up, it's staged, it's, um, it's very, I'm going to put this makeup on this model and I'm going to put them in this exact spot. And to me, yeah, they make pretty images. But for me, it's like, it's not as interesting as a consumer of photography as someone who just responded to a moment and was able to capture it without any planning going in. So I'm curious, where do you land on that kind of dynamic? I think I think it's all degrees of the same thing. I, I think some is, is more... Uh, initially contrived like the you, you know if you build a set and but there's always going to be improvisation there's always someone's going to screw something up and you're going to have to respond to it and the light's not going to be what you thought or someone's going to you know going to set something the wrong way and, and instead of it screwing the whole thing you're going to go oh that's the missing piece like it's it's that I thought it was this but it's the, it's so it, it's just it's all varying degrees of I think of the same thing I think rigidity is very detrimental to creativity I don't know any truly creative people that are that create a lot and create things that are are excellent uh, that are super rigid about things I read a lot of stories about different creative people in different genres, different artists, and they're they're just all very flexible, very fluid, and that rigidity, I just don't see a lot of room for it in creativity. So yes, there is a place for those that really like to geek out on photographers, ephemera, and stuff like this, and go, okay, the moon will be here, and sun will be here, and I, I'm like, okay, whatever, it doesn't interest me. Some people like to, you know, they want to go to Venice and they go want to go to that one spot. And I'm like, if people are at that one spot, I want to go everywhere else because I'm not interested <laughs> in that. You know, if someone says, oh, you got to go here. I'm the guy that's like, yeah, do I? I and, know. Because I'm just I'm the same way. <laughs> I'm just I'm, I'm just not that way. That doesn't make it wrong. But even for those that do, when you get to that spot that every other photographer gets to, you got your work cut out for you. You got to figure out how you're going to make your photograph there, how you're going to bring something new to the table, how you're going to, you know, push. Because you may make that great photograph and be happy with it, but are you going to still be happy with it a year from now when you go back to that place? Are you, are you not going to want to stretch yourself? Are you not going to want to see it from a different perspective? Maybe maybe your tastes have evolved and now you look back and you're like, yeah, that photograph wasn't as strong as the stuff I'm making now. Okay, now you got to bring something new to the to the table in terms of making that photograph. And so I think it's all degrees of the same thing. I, I there are very few people that are so rigid that I'd be like, oh yeah, they're they're really, uh, you know, they've really got creativity figured out in a different way. They're still they're still improvising on some level. Um, it may be over a longer time period, it may be in a different way, but I just can't allow myself to believe that they're showing up with it all figured out because conditions are never perfect in photography and in life. They're just, none of us have it all figured out. And I wanna meet that photographer who's got all the notes and goes and just goes and nails it every time. I haven't yet, and I, I know some of what I would consider the strongest photographers in the world. And all of them speak to the fact that they show up and they have an idea and it doesn't friggin' go to plan and they take some chances and in the end the results were unexpected and they were like, yeah, that's way better. You know, the, the best, some of my, my closest friends are National Geographic photographers and they shoot hundreds of thousands of frames every year to come up with a couple really strong images. 
They're, they're not. I mean, talk about keeper rates. Their keeper rates are in the toilet. I think keeper rates is a terrible way to talk about our photographs, by the way. But, you know, I, the fact is the more risks you keep, anyone with a low keeper rate isn't risking enough. They're not shooting enough. They're not trying uh, to see things from different angles. It's the person with the, like, wildly um, failure-ridden keeper rate that's experimenting and is going to come up with that one image that you go, wow, that's, wow. You know, I, I'm clearly not trying hard enough. Um, again, not sure if I answered your question, but I no, do you... think that there is a, th there is only so far that that pre-planning takes us before we are going to have to improvise. And that's where creativity comes in. Yeah, I love what you said about, you know, going to that popular location that you've probably already seen hundreds of photos from that place before and that your work's cut out for you if you really want to be uh, happy or to create something new that's actually creative. And I think it was kind of a light bulb moment when you said that because I realized that the reason why I like to go to places that I haven't seen images of before or that I've never been to before that are completely new to me is that it isn't as difficult to feel happy about what I've created there because it's completely new to me. I've never seen anyone else photograph that scene before. And it was me just trying to break it down and compose it in an interesting way. And to me, I find a lot of joy out of that process of experimentation and failing. And hopefully sometimes something really cool happens and most of the time it doesn't, but when it does, it feels incredible. I, th I think you would probably agree that our job as photographers is not primarily uh, you know, pushing the button, but that it's it's perceiving and seeing things. And my challenge in a place that I have seen a million photographs of is that I bring expectations of that scene, what it should be, what it could be, what it isn't, what it might not be, I don't know, the whole thing. And our expectations blind us as photographers. And so we should be very suspicious of anything that blinds us and gets in the way of, it's just harder. It is harder to see a place in our own way when you're seeing through the filter of Steve McCurry and Sam Abel and, you know, insert 20 names of photographers here. You're looking, it's like stacking ND filter after ND filter this is to the point where it's like, you're squinting, you're like, nah, I can't see what's out there. Um, I've never used that analogy before, so I got to think about it, see whether it works. But <laughs> it I works. think it does, and it, because for in my experience, the more the more photographs, like if I go to a place, I've stopped taking guidebooks. I've stopped doing the the research of like the ten places I want to see. I go to the place that's going to be give me the best shot at at a very rich environment, and and then I just go out and and I just walk. And what photographers, especially travel photographers, are not doing is spending time. And I get emails all the time. They're like, I'm in Venice for one day. Where should I go? I'm like, you should go to a great restaurant and leave your camera in your room because you're not going to see and photograph Venice meaningfully by hitting all, you know, by going to the three great, so-called great spots. You're just going to get po buy the postcard and go have a fantastic life-changing meal. That's what you should do in Venice. Or... Mm -hmm. I have a better idea, book three weeks and spend three weeks. Don't see all of Italy. See, just spend your three weeks in Venice or Siena or Rome or whatever and really see the place because I can be in a place for five, six days before the dust really settles and I start to see and experience and figure out how to not do the pictures I did last time and not do the pictures I saw from this photographer or that photographer. I go to London and, you know, Sean Tucker's got photographs and I don't know, oh God, or Joshua Jackson, or, you know, insert list of names and you're seeing through his pictures and his pictures and his pictures. It just becomes very hard. So we need to be very suspicious of our expectations and of our influences. We should learn from the masters but we should be very careful about going to a place expecting to come back with work that rivals theirs, that looks like theirs, that we should be going to find places that are uniquely our own and it will be much easier. So that's why I like going back to the same places. I don't, I rarely go to new places anymore because I'm already familiar. I've put in some of that hard work of figuring out how I feel about the place and it's just, it's much easier for me to go back and, and again, to photograph bears uh, rather than a million different subjects because it's the more you get familiar with bears, the more you understand the opportunities and the behaviors and blah, blah, blah. So I think I think that's just piggybacking on, on what you were saying. I think that expectation is really dangerous and we should just be suspicious of it and, 
if going to a different place rather than the must-see place that everyone else has shot. Like you go to Venice, you're going to go to Piazza San Marco, you're going to photograph the waterfront. There's going to be, but the best photographs I've made of Venice have been unexpected in the middle, like back alley somewhere, somewhere I wasn't even expecting a photograph. I'm walking from Magic Place A to Magic Place B, and I turn around a corner and I'm like, oh my God, look at that. And Magic Place C that never, no one is ever going to write about that particular spot. Mm -hmm. That's where the magic happened because it's not the place. It's the intersection between the place, the time, the light, that specific. There's an alchemy there that no guidebook is ever going to tell you about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I totally appreciate the challenge that that presents for the working person who only has two or three weeks of vacation of a year. And, you know, their family books a vacation to Venice or to Italy and, you know, they have vacation FOMO and they feel like they have performative travel, like they have to come home with the epic photographs. And and I can appreciate that. But at the same time, I, t I just think, you know, in some ways it's just leave the camera home and enjoy your time with your family and experience Venice without the need to come home with that epic photograph or or maybe bring the camera, but like you said, like don't force yourself into these locations that it's people say you have to visit. I just think that's a recipe for being disappointed and having your expectations failed. A hundred percent. And I, I think if that's the case, then what's wrong with, you know, like bring your camera and make your family your project. Photograph, you know, mm. photograph black and white journalistic style family vacation. Look, those are the, I don't care how good your other art pictures are going to be by the at the end of your life the pictures of your family are going to be the ones that matter they're going to be the ones that that uh, so do that you know but anyone that i i do i absolutely appreciate what you said and i agree with it and i um but on some level it's just a real catch-22 it's like someone saying well i want to write a novel but i only have five minutes a day well <laughs> i don't know how to help you except to say make the most of that five minutes it's going to take you a long time to write that novel same way as painter says i've got a canvas and I've only got red, what should I paint? I don't freaking know what you should paint. Paint something that's red. I, should, I don't know, you're living, work with the constraint, but you will have a better, if what you really want to do is create a meaningful body of work about Italy or Venice or insert subject matter here, you need to spend time there. And I can't help you if if your big priority is, well, I, I you know, I, I, I think there's a compromise, like a lot of family, uh, vacations nobody is up at <laughs> everyone's getting up at nine o'clock they're going down for coffee and look get up at six you've got three hours go photograph that's your time right problem solved you know like i you probably got chat lag anyway you're going to be up at five put your pants on and go out with your camera photograph right. for three hours and then yeah there will be some opportunistic shots as you go and do your thing with the family but maybe that's when you put your you put your documentary hat on and you photograph the family. And like I said, they'll probably be more meaningful in the end anyway. Yeah, I agree. Well, I got a couple more questions for you, David. Yeah. Uh, what are a few practical tips that photographers can get from you that are looking to enhance their creativity? Wow. Well, okay. The first <laughs> one is you, you got to embrace your constraints. Like, and we touched on this, but you can't wait for time to be perfect for conditions to be perfect to to have the right gear everyone is missing something like you everyone you, you whether that's i mean i just i four months ago we haven't touched on this four months ago i got my my foot amputated um I, i'm feeling very keenly feeling the loss of a certain but you can't there are things i i can now do with my prosthesis that i couldn't do before um, and there are going to be things like I can't get up in the middle of the night and just walk to the bathroom, right? There, there are constraints. Everyone's got them. And creativity is about learning to work within those constraints. So stop making excuses. Stop the moaning and groaning that you don't have the same gear that I have or the same luxury of time. Because in my experience, the people that are like, ah, I just don't have, I only have three weeks a year. Yeah, okay, but you also have a steady job. And when you go and do those three weeks, you can probably en really enjoy them. Whereas I'm neurotically running around trying to make a living. That's the downside of being a professional photographer. Everyone's got constraints. Everyone's missing something. Figure it out. Work with those constraints, not against them. That's the creativity is a muscle. It needs a problem to solve. It needs something to push against. And I would say embrace it. The other is spend time. Like 
spend a lot of time. If you can, instead of going everywhere, go one place and re go, go deep, use your time to go deeper, um, there's huge benefit in that. Even if it's just every Saturday for a year, photographing the flowers in your backyard, rather than doing the flowers and then the car show the next month and then the, the air show the next month and then I've got some pictures of a soccer game that I'm, you're just, that's fine if that scratches the itch for you, but in terms of the craft of photography, you are not going to get noticeably better and master your subject matter doing that than you will focusing. Focusing is important. And the other thing that I would say is really important is you got to study the masters. Study photographs, not to emulate, but to figure out what makes a photograph work. And, and don't ask like, should I do this and, and should I do that? But how do you feel? Look at a picture. It's all there. There's no secrets. Look at it go, why do I feel the way I do about this? Why do I not care? Why do I care deeply? Why did I laugh? Where does my eye go? What's the, what are the colors doing? What's the composition like? What lens maybe did the photographer use? What uh, point of view? Did they put it low? Did they put it high? Were they really close? Were they far? Figure that stuff out. Make it second nature so that when you're photographing, you're thinking in visual language terms mm -hmm. and undistracted by some of these lesser matters. And you're thinking about what makes a good photograph, something compelling, something that's going to touch a human heart and mind, stir our imagination. Figure that out. And you don't do that by scrolling in this. This, by the way, this is not studying. Like this is like clicking hearts. It, that's not studying. That's buy a book of photographs, go to a, or, you know, if you don't have the budget, go to Sam Abel's website, Elliot Irwin, like find the masters that you are interested in and go to their, their actual portfolios and look at the photograph and spend 15, 20 minutes and make notes. And I, I like magazines cause I can get a red Sharpie and I can, I can make notes about the composition and visual mass and where lines are directing my eye. And that stuff is what makes photographs, not cameras. Cameras do not make photographs. I mean, cameras catch, you know, photons and they do their magic thing. And I love cameras, but it's composition. That's that kind of stuff. Figure it out. So study the masters. That is my biggest thing. Study photographs. Put the BNH catalog away. Everyone I know can cite chapter and verse on the latest BNH catalog, and they still can't tell me what makes a compelling photograph. Oh, there's a story. Not necessarily, but if there is a story, what do you know about storytelling visually? Like, what are the elements of a, a visual story? Well, go big, go small, go detail. I, I should say if that's the best you got, you're not telling stories, right? Not every photograph tells a story. Some photographs are abstracts. What makes a good abstract? If you like Impressionism, look at the history of, of Impressionism. Look at Monet and study the masters in that genre. But but by God, get past the camera. Get Because I love my cameras. I truly, truly love my cameras. But they are not what make photographs. So you got to get past them. The sooner you can get past them and actually study photographs, the better your photographs will be. Amen. End of sermon. Pass the tray. <laughs> no, it's. I totally agree. I mean, one of my. I have lots of photography books. I love looking through them, and you know, especially you know, like you come across an image in a book and it stops you in your tracks. That's the opportunity to ask yourself why. What What is it about this image that made me stop in my tracks? What are the visual elements? What's the composition? What's the light? What was the photographer doing? What were the techniques? You might not know the answer, but asking those questions is going to make you a better photographer for your own work, I think. So 100%. And and by photography books, I don't mean, you know, I don't mean books that teach photography. I mean books of photographs, like yeah. bodies of work. Exactly. Um, cuz cuz the other stuff, the pictures that go into a book about photography are generally they're kind of they're example photographs about how depth of field works, but they're not necessarily good photographs. Like there's right. a lot of photography <laughs> books that they're good because they accomplish what they're meant for, which is I'm going to illustrate depth of field. But as a photograph, you probably don't want to be going out and emulating those or learning from those except the lesson, which is, oh, that's what that depth of field looks like with that lens at that distance from subject. Well, that's a good lesson, but it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the bigger stuff, the visual design stuff.
mm-hmm. and uh, and really like like look at one picture every day and just sit down with it for 20 minutes. Put it on your coffee table and let it be open and maybe it sits there for a week and you give it a little bit of time every day. That would be more beneficial than the 30 minutes that you spent every day scrolling through Instagram. I, I don't know that we learn a lot from Instagram. I'm not saying it's of no value. I'm just saying it's not of that value. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, I do want to talk about your foot amputation, but maybe we can save that as a bonus episode for our Patreon supporters because I think there could be some interesting sure. insights yeah, I got, in that I conversation. I got nothing but time. So a couple more questions for the main episode here. Um, tell us about your contact sheets and why people might want to take a look at them. What, what are they? What are they for? What value yeah, do they so- offer? So every photographer in the world's got a newsletter. Um, I, I don't because, frankly, my life is not that interesting and I don't have that much news. Uh, and most people I have found aren't actually interested in me. They're interested in themselves and their photography, as they should be. So I write every, roughly every two weeks. I write an article that goes into the contact sheet. It's my newsletter. Uh, and send it out to uh, about 50,000 subscribers now. Um, and it talks about the art and craft of photography and creativity and um, they're not so much tutorials although every now and then there's a link to something I'm teaching about Lightroom or whatever but it's uh, it's it's kind of I send it on Sundays because it's kind of like getting your Sunday you know the church of photography uh, sermon and it's it's not regurgitated stuff it is my best it's what I send as my contribution to the photography world and uh, most people that are on my list have said you know I'm the only newsletter that or email that they still open because they know that it's going to make them feel a certain way that they're going to learn something and so it's and once in a while I offer one of my courses and and there's a little bit of selling involved in hopes that something I offer you will benefit if you're interested in that I mean the nice thing is you can you can read it until you uh, until I don't serve your purposes anymore and then you can unsubscribe and I will go cry in the corner but you can carry on happily with your life uh, so mycontactsheet.com is uh, is where you could go most easily to uh, to sign up. And again, you know, um, I usually also I will send like I, I'll create when I do a project, I'll create a monograph of that work um, that will go to as you know, like with Patreon subscribers, they'll get a certain thing. Um, the people that get my monographs for free are my subscribers, just as a way of saying thanks for being part of this and. Um, Every now and then I do a giveaway and, and that sort of This time I did a giveaway, I think. Uh, anyway, my, mycontactsheet.com, if, uh, if that's, um, give it a try. And if you don't like it, you can unsubscribe. I'll, uh, I'm going to do that right when we're done. Sounds you awesome. should. Can't believe you're not a subscriber. Ugh. I know. I will be after, by the end of the day, though. Don't worry. All right. <laughs> All right. One last question, David. Who inspires you and why? Who are some people we should know about? I'm an old school guy. Um, who inspires me right now? I mean, I, again, I, I'm a study the masters guy. I, I don't know the modern, I mean modern, I don't know my contemporaries as well as I should, but um, a photographer that I absolutely love is Sam Abel. He was a National Geographic photographer for years. I'm not sure if he still shoots for the Geographic, but I love Sam Abel's stuff. I love Elliot Erwitt. Elliot has an eye for juxtaposition. Mm. Um, and, uh, there's a humor in his comment, in his photography that, um, it, I mean, you would think that being a former comedian, there would be something funny in my photographs. There's never anything funny in my photographs, <laughs> but Elliot Erwitt nails it in terms of humor and it's wit. It's not often ha ha, but it's like, ah, oh, I see what you did there. Um, uh-huh. I love Elliot Erwitt. Um, for color, I really love Fred Herzog. He was a Vancouver photographer and his he was an early colorist uh, in the school of Ernst Haas and uh, and Ernst Haas. You, you've got to, to look at Ernst Haas's work. He's amazing. But uh, there was something about Herzog, maybe because he was from Vancouver. His color work was just, I thought, really beautiful. Willie Roney is a French photographer whose work is, um, he's like Henri Cartier-Bresson, but has like a real heart. Um, Henri Cartier-Bresson was sometimes, I think of him a little bit sort of, uh, a little bit kind of like cerebrally, but Willie Roney, he was in there photographing like the real heart of things, and I love his stuff. Mm. Um, so that would be a, that would be a great starting point. But um, uh, because none of those involve wildlife, and I am I am 
more and more interested in wildlife. I would say Paul Nicklin, who's a very good friend of mine, um, and I adore his uh, his stuff, especially his work with the sea leopards. Uh, and the guy is, uh, in French, his name is Vincent Mounier, Vincent Mounier, if you were anglicizing it, Vincent Mounier. Um, his work with wildlife is astonishing. That That's the one, that's my answer. Okay, I'm settling on it. Final answer, <laughs> Vincent, Vincent Mounier, uh, Vincent Mounier is unbelievable. His It transcends quote unquote wildlife photography and it is just pure art. I adore his stuff. That's who you gotta look up, Vincent Mounier. Beautiful. Well, David, this has been tremendous. Really fun. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you to David for the amazing conversation. I feel like we would get along very well and your thoughts resonate with me profoundly. Keep up the great work. I highly encourage listeners to subscribe to David's newsletter by checking out the link in the show notes. Lastly, I want to thank our latest Patreon supporter, David Foster. If you're like David and you like this podcast, I'd be humbled if you supported the podcast financially on Patreon. Not only does Patreon put food on my table for me and my family, it is also how you signal to me that I'm doing something that you value. We operate on the value for mo- We operate on the value for value model here. And I think if you value it, then you should pay for it. Anything more than zero is fair in my book. Thank you to the 200 plus kind and generous souls who already do. You're truly appreciated. I would love to hear from you and get your feedback on this episode. The best way to join in that conversation is to join us for free on Patreon. You do not need to be a supporting member on Patreon to comment, although I do appreciate it if you are. Each week, I'll be creating a thread for the episode on Patreon for listeners to join in on. To get started, join us over on patreon.com forward slash fstop and listen, or check out the link in the show notes. I look forward to engaging with all of you there. That's all for now. Thanks for stopping in, collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.